and the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy describes the blessings of the obedient and the troubles of the disobedient. And among uh, the troubles of the disobedient is what we're writing about now. The Lord said, I will scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And the people of Judah had better take that warning and they would be driven out of their homeland unless they would strengthen up their way of living and straighten their lives out. But instead, they lapsed into a state of apostasy and ended up being scattered from one end of the earth to the other. Every country in the world has a population of Jews. There are, I don't think, if memory serves me right, that there is any section of this country that is not populated by some Jews. These were God's people that were scattered because of their disobedience and because of their refusal to amend their ways. The sins of the nation, the nation of Israel, were scattered. Only now, since 1948, have they been able to go back to their homeland and establish their nation again. Jeremiah was to stand in the gates of the Lord's house. The buildings and the courts clustered there were indeed the temple of the Lord. But it was a lie to repeat the truth over and over with the assurance that Jehovah would always protect his people just because his dwelling was among them. The popular thinking was quoted by another prophet at an earlier time. Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. That was mistaken thinking. The presence of the Lord's temple would not protect crooked people unless they would amend their ways and their doings. God always promises blessings, but there are stipulations that goes along with the blessings. Trust ye not in lying words, says the fourth verse, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly exercise, or I'm sorry, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt. God is speaking, y'all. He's speaking truth. He's speaking words to them. To let them know that, listen, I want to bless you, but you're trusting in these lying prophets saying the temple of the Lord, and it's not going to happen. I'm not going to bless you if you keep on doing wrong. I am not going to dwell with you if you keep on doing wrong. One thing that needed to be amended was the work of the courts of law. In his early indictment of Judah, Micah said the heads thereof uh, judge for reward. That is, the judges could be bribed. That had been their way for a long time, but it would bring disaster to the nation if it was not taken care of, if they would not stop doing it. Okay, a stranger in town could easily become a victim of fraud, extortion, or robbery. He had no friends to take his part, and the corrupt court system that they had in that day would take advantage of him. The fatherless, the widow, all those people were in trouble. Nobody would give him any help. An orphan or a widow had no man for protection and no money to bribe the judges. They were easy prey for a crooked bribe, for a crooked judge, or a crook without a conscience. Since judges were for sale, a rich man could even murder without fear of punishment. But God, the eyes of the Lord, is in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God took note of all the injustices that they were predicting upon the people. If the crooks and killers would not amend their ways, disaster was headed for the whole nation. The king was destroying the altars and idols of those who followed out other gods instead of Jehovah. But there was no way he could stop secret worship. Even those who came to Jehovah's temple could not uh, home and have, could, could, they could go home and have a feast for Baal. But if it would be to their hurt, not to their advantage, it would hasten the invasion and destruction of Judah. That's why I tell people all the time, you cannot make a person live saved. It has to come from the heart. You can't follow a person and make them do right. If right is not in them, they're not going to do right. You can't make a person tell the truth. If the truth is not in them, it's not going to come out. As I often speak the parable about the little boy with the lightning bug who went to his father and asked his father, Dad, what makes this lightning bug light up? And his father said, I don't know, son, but give me a little time to kind of research it and find out. And while his father was researching, a little boy took the lightning bug and tore him apart, cut him open and dissected him like little boys will do. And the little boy got through taking that lightning bug apart. He ran back to his father. 
told his father, that's all right, Dad. You don't have to find out what makes the lightning bug light up. He said, why not, son? He said, because I found out. He said, well, tell me, what makes the lightning bug light up? He said, it's the stuff that he got on the inside. Whatever's on the inside going to come on the outside. If you got lying in you, you're going to lie. You can't stop a liar from lying. The only thing that's going to stop a liar from lying, you got to get the stuff out of him. And the only way you're going to get it out of him, he got to get shown up saved. I wish I had a little help around here. God will if we allow him. There was still time for them to avoid the disaster if they would put a stop to the injustice and murder and idolatry. They could be secure in their homeland. But going to the temple would not make them secure if they went back home to continue in their crooked and cruel ways. I know I'm stepping heavy tonight, but you know, it's the truth. Going to church ain't going to save you. Salvation got to come from the heart. You got to get saved when you come to church. Come to church, well, I'm a good Christian. I go to church. Go to, going to church don't save you. You got to have a change in your life. There's got to be a change made. And when a change is made, it's no problem to go to church. You love church. People want to say, Pastor, I know where you go to church all the time. There are a lot of things I don't do because I don't have time to do. I'm saved. I love living for the Lord. And, and somebody asked me, do you love preaching? Listen, I'd rather preach than eat. I, I just love preaching. I'd rather hear good preaching than eat. Because to me, the Word of God to me is, is, is just something wonderful. And I think when a person really gets the Word in them, it means a lot for a person to really be sincere about their salvation. Not just religious, because religion is just a duty, but I mean salvation. Really doing something about yourself. Jesus gave a blessing to the pure in heart. You remember what he said, blessed are the pure in heart. God's people are altogether devoted to him. Jeremiah was looking at people like those described in Proverbs. People pure in their own eyes, but not washed from their filthiness. And, but not washed from their filthiness. They worship God in the temple and live for the devil at home. They were double-minded, unstable in all their ways, and so they could not expect God's blessings. Lying words. The eighth verse said, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, said the Lord. But go ye now into my place, unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first. And see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these works, said the Lord, and I speak unto you rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. That's God speaking. The house with the temple in Jerusalem. Jeremiah was supposed to stand at its gate to tell the people it was going to be destroyed as Shiloh had been. It was the temple of God called by his name. But that would not save it from being destroyed. No. The people were trusting in the temple, thinking God would take care of them just because it was there. But they were going to be disappointed. God would not take care of them unless they would amend their doings. And destruction would not come to the temple only. But the whole country, the whole house of Israel, was the place that God gave to the people of Judah and to their fathers. And destruction would sweep the whole land. Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle was set up. When the people of Israel finished their conquest of the far promised land, you remember that. The center of worship remained there for a long time. But the wickedness of God's people, Israel, kept growing with the high priest's son leading the way, the sons of Samuel. Therefore, the Lord allowed the Philistines to defeat Israel and captured the Ark of the Covenant. Probably the Philistines then went on to destroy Shiloh. But though that fact is not recorded in the book of Samuel, Jeremiah was preaching centuries later 
But still, anyone going to Shiloh would find only ruins. Jerusalem and the temple would likewise be ruined unless the people would listen to Jeremiah and stop the wickedness of their ways. A den of robbers. You look at a den of robbers. The heartless people of Judah imagined they could find safety by going to the temple to worship, even if they carried stolen money in their hands to buy a lamb for sacrifice. And even if they were going out to steal again by fraud or by violence, the temple was dishonored in their eyes when they saw it as a cover for crookedness rather than as a house of prayer. In a later time, Jesus pointed out that the crooked merchants doing business in the temple likewise desecrated the Lord's house when he took a whip and whipped them out of the temple. The temple was the house of the Lord. It was built to glorify him. His glory was placed in the temple. He glorified it by filling it with his glory and putting his name there. But not even the house of the Lord was safe in a land that's full of sin. If the people would keep on making it a den of robbers rather than a house of prayer, then temple and people alike would be destroyed together. That's why I tell people foolishness should not be carried on in the sanctuary of the house of the Lord. When you go there, you don't go to church to chew gum and hold conversations. You go there to magnify and worship the Lord. All of the things that the people were doing, stealing, robbing, committing adultery, all of these things were flagrant violations of God's law. A little after the middle of Josiah's reign, the long neglected book of the law was found in the temple where they had hid it and it was covered with dust. It was read to the people and they promised to obey it at that time. If Jeremiah gave this sermon after that, if the people were still committing the sins listed in this verse, then those people knew they were breaking both God's law and their own promise to God to keep it. It was rank hypocrisy to stand in the temple of the Lord and go through the motions of worshiping while disobeying the Lord constantly between times of worship. Because they went to worship, people might say God would deliver them from all their enemies and all their troubles. But such words were among the lying words mentioned in the 8th verse. God would not forever continue to deliver those that were guilty of hypocrisy. These folk were saying one thing with their lips, but their hearts were far from it. They were in constant transgress of God's law. They were committing spiritual adultery on a regular basis. They were praising God in the temple, and when they left the temple, they were going to worship Baal. This is the idolatry. This is the, the sense of... Of, of, of adultery that God is speaking of here when he speaks in the ninth verse and says that will you steal murder and commit adultery and swear falsely you walk into the temple and lift up hands to God leave the temple and go home and fall on your knees to Baal spiritual adultery God abhorred it and God would not stand for it but yet these people were guilty of it no one is so far away that God does not see him and know what he's doing the psalmist said the eyes of the Lord is in every place. They're holding the evil and the good. And David said if I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I take the wings of the morning and fly to the utmost parts of the world, God is there. God had been watching over Judah with special care and providence. He was going to put the people of Judah out of that land and out of his special care. Ephraim was the biggest of the ten tribes that had revolted and formed a separate nation in the north part of Israel. And the name of that tribe here, when he said, even the whole seed of Ephraim, that tribe here, it means that the people of that whole nation had been cast out of their land already. The ruins of Shiloh showed what was going to happen to the temple. God was going to demolish the temple if most of the gross sinners didn't go to church. But Jeremiah preached to the people going to worship. Does his sermon apply to us today? We do not steal, but do we rob God by being stingy with our offerings and refuse to pay our tithes? We do not murder, or do we? Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. We do not commit adultery. Do we give attention to shows that excuse and even glorify it? We do not square falsely. Do we make our word so dependable that no oath is needed to show that we're telling the truth? We need to check ourselves and see how this lesson applies to us. As you stand before your students tomorrow, you look and see what's going on. Take a self-examination because you can't point the finger at everybody else without putting a thumb on yourself. 
realize where in God do you stand and understand that God is able to forgive. We're under grace and truth and the grace of God has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly and righteously in this present world. Stand before your class tomorrow and before your students. Let them know that God is yet God and he's able to deliver if we want to be delivered. Sin is a reproach to any people. We got to get rid of that sin and let God know that God I'm coming clean. I love all of you out there and I want you to know that God will bless your soul. Yes, he will. Meet us tomorrow. If you need a good church home, come on over for the blessings of the Lord are taking place.